Lily Tyson, the Marketing and Program Director for the Embryo Adoption Awareness Center and Nightlight Christian Adoptions. This morning, we're very pleased to bring you the webinar entitled Getting Personal, and we'll have three families share their personal embryo donation and adoption journeys. Today, we are joined by Ann Clark, who lives in Colorado, Amy Atsides from Arizona, and Dan and Jamie Felice from Illinois. I hope those states right for each of them. They'll each be telling you a bit more about themselves, so I'll leave that up to them, and a lot more about their experiences with embryo donation and adoption. Now, housekeeping. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation using the questions that you submit through the Q&A feature. I forgot forward to the lovely pictures of our, our presenters today. There they are. And here is a slide about how you can submit questions. And I'm really going to encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation today. It doesn't interrupt the presentation, and uh, you can you know, just ask the question that pops into your head. So questions, simply click on the Q&A panel in the lower right-hand portion of the screen, type in your question to the dialog box, and then click the Send button. Uh, this will open the Q&A panel in your screen only when you click on that icon, and then when you type your question and submit it, it's visible to all of the panelists, but not to the other attendees. That's the theory anyway. Sometimes we wonder how WebEx is working, but uh, that's the theory. We'll be distributing a copy of today's presentation and a comprehensive list to all of the questions that are, are asked today with the answers to those questions. We expect the presentation to last maybe over 45 minutes today since we have so many presenters. But even if your question is not answered during the webinar today, you will receive an answer to that question. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the presentation, please contact WebEx directly, and that number is there on your screen, 866-229-3239. Uh, a reminder, this presentation is being recorded today. With that, I would like to turn it over to our first presenter, who is Ann Clark. Ann um, donated her embryos at a time before embryo adoption was an available option. So with that, Ann, let's turn to you. Well, hello. Um, my name is Ann Clark, and I am honored to share my story with you today. My husband, uh, Dan, and I have two beautiful children um, born in 1992 and 1995. B is getting ready to graduate from high school this year, so it seems eons ago. My pilot, so he's not available to join us today, but um, I'm glad that I can be here to share with you. When married, uh, next slide, Coralie. And when we were married, um, we were 24 and my husband was 29, and we were both building our careers, and we decided to wait a couple of years and settle into being newly married to have children. When we decided we were ready to try, uh, things didn't go quite as we had planned, and I had my first ectopic pregnancy in 1987. And again, we kept trying, thinking, you know, this would work, something would happen, and I had a second ectopic pregnancy in 1989. And at that time, we started looking at, um, you know, infertility issues, and I was told that the tube that I had was still good, um, but, you know, things weren't working, and... Um, into what things were available for us. And uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on that slide. I should be paying attention. Um, there were great advancements at that time in medical procedures in, in vitro. Things were growing by leaps and bounds. And I saw an article um, about a meeting on information for the in vitro procedure. Prior to this time, the in vitro was all done in a hospital setting, and this was the first time it was being allowed in a clinic setting. And um, so we decided to go forward with this procedure. I went through the first in vitro cycle in 1991. Um, they were aggressive with the medications that they were using, and I was very sensitive to the drugs, and I produced many eggs. And um, actually, it was very cost-effective at that time. It was only $3,500 for that, that first procedure. We did have to do everything through the clinic. 
On the procedure, they actually put in six embryos. And again, because my hormone levels were so high, they were very concerned about multiples. But thankfully, we had um, one, only one child. And the next slide, you'll see his picture as a baby. Um, Colin Clark was our firstborn. And, um, and what a joy he was in our lives. We had about that time to Colorado. So I was attending or uh, going to was in San Antonio. Uh, we did have a few extra embryos, and they were frozen, and we went through another cycle, uh, next slide, in 1993, and only the embryos survived the um, thaw, and it was not a successful transfer. But we wanted to have another child, at least one more. We, weren't, we knew we weren't done. So in 1994, next slide, um, went through the procedure again, and it was our second in vitro. By now, it had been another two or three years since doing it in a clinic setting, and um, cost had gone up considerably. It was about $9,000. We were very blessed to have some money that was gifted from our family as well as insurance coverage that covered part of that. Um, but I was commuting from Colorado. My parents lived in San Antonio, and her neighbor was a nurse, and so I went down there and stayed for a couple of weeks in San Antonio going through the procedure, and Mom's neighbor was actually giving me the shots, um, which is really interesting. Interesting. But we were stimulated um, and produced many eggs and um, and many embryos, and we they did three embryos this time instead of the six. Out of those three, two of them took. Um, one later, I had two pregnancies, or two, I'm sorry, they were twins, I guess, um, but one later, one wasn't developing properly and um, didn't make it. Um, but I was blessed. Uh, next slide. For our second child, um, Weston was born in January 1995. Uh, so, for the remaining embryos that we had, and um, the agreement was that it would they would be frozen for, I believe, three years. And you know, during that period of time, I was a busy mom of two young boys now, and my husband was gone traveling a lot. I hadn't thought much about, um, you know, what's going to happen there. I really don't remember um, anybody telling me that we would have a decision about those. And I wasn't really sure that I was done, um, you know, having two children. But in 1998, if you, next slide, um, the called and said a decision had to be made about the remaining embryos. I basically had three choices. I could avoid them, you know, they were going to be thought I could destroy them. Um, I could donate them to science. Um, and I, that just scared me. I was thinking Frankenstein experiments. I mean, I know the scientific experiments have, you know, been in, in in the development of these programs, but I just couldn't do that. And then, and donating to another couple was another option. Or I could pay three hundred dollars a year to continue them. Um, really couldn't figure out why somebody else would want my embryos. It it, it just didn't matter to me. Um, I think that my struggle was that. I was doing, and what I considered these were my babies. You know, after conceiving two children through this procedure, these were my babies, and I just couldn't wrap my mind around donating my babies. And um, it was a very difficult decision. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, um, I wouldn't know if there were live births. I had no control over who these embryos were being given to, um, and it was very fearful for me. I. I thought my, my mind went to a lot of scary places. What if, just all the what ifs, what if it went to a family who wasn't a good family? What what if I walked down the road one day and saw someone who was a spitting image of one of my children, you know, and would I, I would always wonder, was there a baby and is this baby being cared for properly? Uh, slide. I was in our community in Colorado and um, really didn't have a lot of support um, and I kind of had different thoughts. He was pretty sure he was done having children, and and I'm absolutely certain. I really didn't have any counsel. Um, my husband thought they're just cells, and he couldn't understand why it was so difficult for me to make a decision. But he did allow me to make that decision. I considered the options. Ultimately, I knew that these embryos deserved a chance at life, and I had to resolve. That in mind, the way that I resolved it is that God is the giver of all life, and so I had to release my fears to his sovereignty, even if. Even if we messed up in the worst way, it's 
to be children, you know, my part was to give them that opportunity. If they were meant to be babies, they would be. And um, just a very traumatic thing for me. Uh, next slide. And who has gone through infertility, I think, can understand the emotional roller coaster that you go through. Um, first, recognizing that you have difficulty getting pregnant and then deciding how to proceed. And then having to come across this kind of a decision, it was, it was very traumatizing to me. Next slide. I don't remember um, the clinic ever addressing the possibility of being extra embryos or that I would have to do anything with them. Um, I think I was so focused on my desire for having children that you don't think about those things. And, um, but in 1997, we decided to donate those embryos. There was two infertile couples um, waiting for those embryos. And I had to sign a consent to thaw them and then a donation form to give them and basically sign away any rights to knowing anything. Um, but I was okay with that. I had made that decision. I knew that they deserved that opportunity. The next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it wasn't too long after that um, that I was driving my oldest son to preschool one morning, and I heard on the radio on Focus on the Family about snowflake embryo adoption, and I thought, how cool is that? If only, you know, if this would only been around when I had to make that decision, I know that I would have certainly considered this option. And um, within another month after that, I had another ectopic pregnancy, which really confirmed my, um, you know, my struggle in that inf infertility process of wondering if I ever get pregnant on my own. It confirmed that it wasn't possible for me and that these these children were a gift of God. Uh, next slide. I'm glad that um, this option is available for others, and that's why I'm here today to share my story. Uh, I wish I would have known about, about this option, um, and there were many of the unknowns would have been resolved. To have some say in um, what my children are going to, and to know if they were children. Um, and then next slide, please. Started working with the Snowflake Adoption Agency. Um, she asked me if I would share my story. It's been open with other people about my journey in life and struggles, and I think it helps people to know they're not alone in facing these things. Um, I said I really couldn't in a public fashion until I really discussed this further with my children. I always told them they were miracle babies. I think all babies are miracle babies, but I felt I needed to go into a little bit more detail. So I decided to tell them that they were conceived through in vitro, and um, I took them out to lunch one day and sat down with them and, and said, you know, this is what I'm thinking of doing, but I need you to understand a little, little bit more about this. Uh, next slide. And you have to understand, my children are 17 and 20, so they first they said, well, what is in vitro? And so I tried to explain that to them, and, you know, the, the, our desire to have children and the difficulties that we had, and this is we chose to you know, to move forward so that we could have children. And my youngest was going, TMI, TMI, I don't want to know anymore. And my oldest was saying, well, you were conceived in a lab, you know, you mutant. And um, so it's kind of funny. But they're boys, and um, they received it quite well, and they know that they're uh, loved and that they are they truly a special gift. Uh, next slide. I wonder if there are children out there, but I also will always trust that if there are, they are being cared for. I know I did the right thing. I couldn't answer the question, are there siblings? But I'm going to share her story on embryo donations. Yeah. Nice um, my name is Amy, and my husband's name is Tim, and he would love to be today, but he is a golf caddy, and he's in the PGA tournament this week, so he's on the golf course. Um, but I got a pharmaceutical rep for Bristol Myers Squibb, and my husband and I got married um, in 1996. We um, have lived in Arizona now for about 20 years. And if you want to go to the slide, Chloe, thank you. You have two children, um, Jacob and Jordan. And uh, next, next slide. And these, my fertility story starts um, pretty. We um, got married in 1996. And we wanted to start to have children quite quickly, even though I was 27, but I was 31, and we were through with school and through with college and thought, let's start and have some babies. 
um, back in 1991, um, I had a appendicitis, and it ruptured, and it was a pretty serious appendicitis, um, thinking that that would affect me in the future. However, when um, we were pregnant for the first time, I had an ectopic pregnancy in 96, and when they went to remove it, they could see there was a lot of scar tissue and um, said that's probably from your um, appendix everywhere, and they tried to clean it up and said, you know, hopefully your um, other tubes should be fine, so um, proceed to have children, and we'll go from there, but we'll watch you closely when you get a positive pregnancy test back. So there we got pregnant again, and it ended up being another ectopic pregnancy. Um, the other side of my flipping tube, so the left side now as well. Um, so at that point, we knew we probably needed some help with... Um, um, going to the clinic, so we talked with a uh, reproductive endocrinologist. They were hopeful that we could do um, the GIFT procedure, and back then uh, the GIFT procedure was a pretty familiar and used procedure. Um, so we did a histial saltingogram, which basically checks to see if your open tubes are in my heart, apparently. Um, so we tried to do the GIFT procedure with this office in 1998, and once again, had another pregnancy, and at that point, they um, said, okay, it's not going to work. We're going to do a um, tubal ligation, so you're not in this position again. Well, a um, year later, I got pregnant, even with a tubal ligation, and it ended up being a, a abdominal pregnancy, and once again, go in and remove that, and that was pretty risky surgery because it was a, 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 a I guess, a difficult look to, and my femoral artery and ended up having um, major surgery <laughs> during um, my ectopic removal. So pretty, um, pretty um, emotional stress, cost, time through all of the um, craziness for pregnant. So then we went to a switch on um, X and went to try um, in vitro fertilization with a different clinic who seemed to specialize in that a little bit more and had really good success rates. So um, next slide. We finally to this next um, fertility clinic, and I used a lot of eggs. I had 27 eggs with my first um, ovarian simulation, and it had actually 20, all 27 actually fertilized. But the clinic uh, um, goes to day five for um, looking at last stage, and out of that 27, 13 um, remained. So I had 13 fresh embryos, and we put two. And the main 11 embryos were frozen. And next slide, um, we were pregnant, and we were so excited after seven years of trying to get pregnant. Um, you know, answered we waited so long for this, and we were just ecstatic. We had a healthy pregnancy, and <coughs> excuse me, Jacob was born in November. So it was such an answer to prayer, and such an easy and so fun. I was like, Aaron, I'd like to have 10 more of these because Jacob was a very, very easy baby and a good baby. Um, so three years later, um, we had moved to New York at the time and um, moved from Arizona to New York, and I had to come back to Phoenix to do my frozen embryo transfer. So at this point, I saw five embryos and three um, the thaw, and they put in those three. And again, I was blessed with my second baby and um, second child. Um, next slide which is Jordan, um, and she was born in October of 2005. So um, we were very, really excited. And at this point, I hadn't really been thinking about the remaining embryos. Um, there. I wasn't sure if I was done yet. I didn't know if we wanted to have more children. So it wasn't really a concern. Um, I went by and I talked about you know, having more children, and we realized that you know, with the completion of it, there came a very, very difficult and um, trying. We didn't know what we didn't know. I did not want to um, donate. To, um, I think that we could do things. I know that, like Anne was saying, a lot of research and things have left to the medical advancements that we have now with this type of technology. Um, and I didn't want to destroy, um, especially after seeing um, my just in Arizona was nice enough to take pictures of my embryos and bring them to me as um, I was getting ready for my transfers with um, my fresh 
and as well as um, my frozen. So it's really interesting to see these little cells turn into Jacob and Jordan. It's just a blessing and it's an amazing miracle. So really um, decision and what we're going to do and how we're going to do this. I had no idea how you even get into a couple. So I was talking to my utility clinic. Options basically were telling me that we could don't. It's all, um, I didn't really have the idea of not knowing who I was going to do donate to. So um, asking around, kind of going on the internet, looking at different options. And I, I remember talking to a nurse as I was leaving um, my fertility clinic one day and she had mentioned snowflakes and it didn't have to be, um, you know, I was really excited about potentially donating to a couple that maybe I, I could have some parameters picked out and maybe, you know, know who this couple was and, and um, hopefully have some open contact and know if the ever became babies and potentially hope, hopefully that um, we would be able to have pictures and some kind of contact for especially our kids. We want our, our, my kids to know their genetic symbols if this ever came to be um, babies. So I went home and I um, researched snowflakes embryo adoption and I was amazed at how much information was there. And I was pretty happy with the options of knowing open embryo adoption. So um, my husband and I prayed about it. We talked about it. I kind of um, went back and forth for a while about whether we wanted to have family or try again. And, you know, we just, it's really going back and forth with your husband trying to figure out you know, it's the right thing to do. So um, finally, we decided to fill out all the paperwork and went to the home study and did everything we could with the genetic history and got all the paperwork signed off to Snowflakes. And it was pretty quickly um, that I realized that we um, got cell files. I'd say within the first maybe three to four months, um, we had some profiles in front of us. And it's important for us too to have open adoption or open um, embryo adoption because coming back to me, um, I'm adopted as well. And I think just not knowing this as a kid who my genetic um, murder or never thought about um, being. My parents told me at a very young age, so I wanted um, this to be an open option procedure as well with the family that we were donating our embryos to. Um, you know, just in case the kids had questions as they were growing up, if these embryos became babies, did they want what we looked like? Did they want to know if they had siblings? Um, and adoption really is a fantastic gift. I was very fortunate to be adopted into a family that really wanted children and um, loved me, and I never, ever... My parents were not my parents. They absolutely 100% my parents. And the siblings that I grew up with were my siblings. I never looked at this as an adoption or not genetically related. It didn't matter to me. So I just wanted to make sure that um, the family that I donated to, if they, if the children wanted to or, or if um, they wanted to know more questions or answers about anything about their genetic um, family, that they would be able to have that as an option. Um, Slide. Tim and I um, finally with profiles, and we prayed over them for, actually, I guess probably a couple of weeks. And then we received uh, Dan and Jamie, a couple that we ultimately ended up uh, donating those to. We were thrilled. Um, everything on their profile seemed um, very much touched our hearts. Um, the story was very similar to ours. Really wanted to share these embryos, and you know, I look at this as you know, they weren't my embryos; they were God's in the first place. So I could give them up in that way, thinking, you know, they weren't mine; they were God's. And now, hopefully, we can help another couple out by donating these embryos to, to a couple that's going through what my husband and I have been going through for years. Um, so we were, as proud parents, we wanted to share the joy of parenthood and end that black cloud of infertility for another couple. And secondly, as I adopt a child myself. Um, I can the joy of being placed into a family that really wants you and really loves you. And it's a prayer for all of us, um, for Tim and I to be able to, you know, go to a family and help them and family to end the, you know, black cloud of infertility for them as well. Um, so we're hoping that um, we would be selected because, um, you know, we select them. Um, they also have to look at our embryology report and look at all our history and hopefully, you know, accept our embryo. So we were hoping it was going to be a positive outcome. Um, and one 
and Jamie's story that spoke to us this was um, similar stories. We had ectopic pregnancies. Um, I, they were from the Midwest, um, hardworking people, um, and they seemed a sense of humor in their profile. They seemed adventurous to Tim and I. Um, we had very similar uh, religious views and similar economic views, and um, probably one of the most important things about is that they were open to contact um, and update us if the embryos became babies, that they would be able to, you know, contact us and let us know um, how they're doing and hopefully some pictures. And, you know, we would just see Flint um, if, older, if the embryos became children. Um, but we talked about um, transferring, and they did accept our embryos. So it was the answer there for all of us. And um, the feelings we had initially about them have been... Um, confirmed years, they have stepped up um, with pictures and updates, and Jamie and I um, email and, and Facebook pictures. So we're thrilled that we have that kind of contact with one another. Um, my children, um, Jacob is nine, and God gave me a nine-year-old and an eight-year body <laughs> because my my son is very wise and um, he has lots of questions and he asks me constantly about him. Um, siblings, and he sees pictures that um, Dan and Jamie send us, and he loves seeing those, and so does Jordan, my five, my six-year-old, but Jacob seems to remember on this because of my story of being adopted. He understands the concept of adoption, and he understands in very simple terms that um, Tim and I have another couple um, pregnant with parts from me and parts from their dad, and uh, he realizes that they have the same cells, the same blood as him, and he just adores the pictures of the kid. And he has stories already about, you know, the little girl is like his little sister, um, Jordan. He thinks his little sister Jordan is a girl. He always asks us about what faith is like. Um, so there's a lot of cute little stories that go along with um, the siblings, the genetic siblings. Um, so it's been a very positive experience for us. And we do understand that they have genetic siblings that are out there, and we hope to meet soon. Um, but the dates from Jamie and Dan are priceless, and um, my kids enjoy that. Um, next slide. Um, just read the slide because it really does kind of put things in perspective for everybody. Um, I know that those little embryos are now someone's children, and what a gift to both of us. We helped fulfill a dream of a family for Dan and Jamie and fulfilled our wish to see these tiny embryos become healthy and happy children. And such a wonderful and deserving couple. I mean, every time I show pictures of Dan and Jamie with, I call them babies. Um, our family mentions our family. It looks, you know, they always mention how wonderful the family looks and that Dan, Dan and Jamie seem doting on their um, children, which is very true. And um, it just, you know, warms our heart to see pictures and talk with Jamie. And um, we're just confirmed that we made the right decision 100%. We are definitely at peace um, decision that we made um, for this couple to have our and we're thrilled um, to success. And I would have no reservation in encouraging or recommending to other couples who have been going through our situation with infertility. And you're so hyper-focused on getting pregnant. Don't think about the extra embryos that you may have um, after your family is complete. You know, Slice organization has been great um, for Tim and I. It's, they've walked us through things. And uh, if you need support or need to reach out to other couples that have gone through this already, they've made that happen as well, made that available to Tim and I. Um, and actually, this whole process has really exceeded um, Tim and my expectations. Um, we're just thrilled that the embryos became babies and that Dan and Jamie are um, the parents of the embryos. And, and it just seems like an absolute miracle all the way around. And we know our embryos are exactly where they're supposed to be with, with Dan and Jamie. So we are throw. And that's the end of my open adoption or um, embryo adoption. I'll turn it over to Jamie and Dan um, who will talk about their open embryo adoption. So much, Amy. Oh, I have to try not to cry so I can present here. <laughs> that was so sweet. Um, we feel, as you know, the same way. So um, to be presenting today uh, on our story about open embryo adoption. Um, next slide. 
first slide. Um, we were married in June of 2004, and unlike I think the other two couples, we did get married a little bit later in life. Um, I was in my mid-30s, and Dan was in his late 30s. So we knew we wanted kids, and we knew that it gets more difficult as you get older. So we only did for about six months and uh, decided to start trying to have a family. Next slide. After a year of no success, um, we decided to go see a fertility specialist just to get checked out, make sure everything was okay um, so that we can deal with any issues um, if we knew something major was going on. But we were both uh, fortunate to check out fine, uh, but we knew that my age could still be a factor that could have been causing some of the problems. So we that we would start a very uh, – First, not jump into IVF, so we started to do some uh, elimination attempts, or IUIs, they're called. Um, on our third trip, we were blessed to get positive news that I was pregnant, but unfortunately, that pregnancy ended up being an ectopic pregnancy. So, of course, that had to end, and uh, it was very disappointing, but also encouraging that we, we were to get pregnant. We knew we could get pregnant, so we decided to continue on, and we tried some additional IUAs, which I think totaled up to 11 before you know, finally stopped because we fortunately did not have success again after that initial pregnancy. So now we had to kind of regroup and decided to, you know, just research what our next options would be, talk to our doctor, and we decided to try IVF. Um, and we ended up having four times with IVF. The first two uh, attempts were canceled cycles just due to a lack of response, uh, issues with drugs. I don't even remember right now all the all the problems, but we had to cancel the first two. But we kept pushing on, and we ended up do, having two full cycles of IVF. We developed very uh, high-quality embryos, but there weren't many. I think there were only two or three, so we were excited and hopeful that one of these attempts would be successful. But unfortunately, neither of the uh, IVF attempts result in pregnancy. So, you know, after each attempt failed, we would have to meet with our doctor to discuss, like, our next steps, what may have been the problem, how we can make adjustments. And after our first attempt failed, our doctor had mentioned to us the option of possibly using an egg donor because that couples do, especially due to my age. Again, we, we both checked out fine, but he had to assume that, that that may have been one of the big problems. So, so I kept it in the back of my mind, and we decided that we were going to try the second IVF attempt. Next page, please. Second attempt also did not result in a pregnancy. Um, I pretty much had had enough at that point. I was burnt out. I was just very... You know, just starting to question whether we were meant to have kids, you know, should we start looking into adoption? So I started looking at different, like researching different options, including domestic adoption. Also, I remember the doctor mentioned egg donation, so we started to look into that a little bit. And during my research about domestic adoption, I ran into the website for Snowflake's program on an embryo adoption. And I had never, of course, heard of that before or knew about it, but I, I started to kind of look into that as well. Next slide, please. My second IVF attempt didn't work, and I started doing this research. We met with our doctor, and again, he mentioned about the egg donation option, and I also asked about embryo adoption. And he had said it was an option, but most couples usually like to go with the egg donor so that there is some genetic link to the baby for at least my father it would be in this in this situation and when I asked about uh, egg donation my doctor had recommended the snowflake agency and said if we decided to go that route they were a great agency had been doing this the longest the, the Christian affiliation we liked um, just the flexibility and the stuff I had researched and found out about how you can have contact with uh, the genetics, and that was something very interesting to us. So I'm going to pass it off to my husband, Dan, to discuss just how we came to the decision to pick adoption. Dan, if you'd like to jump in. Yeah, hi, my name is Dan, and I just with that every process had to deal with, once you started realizing you weren't able to conceive on your own, all the unknowns are very scary and very you're just unsure there's so much you need to know and being on the other side it's like wow what an incredible blessing what a great and uh 
and I'm just really encouraged by everything you know we're hearing today, and, and the fact that we um, you know to do it, and we were looking at other options, and I definitely like the idea of okay, we'll use my sperm, a young girl's egg seemed fine to me. I had no problems with it. But I don't know. Then I guess as we learn more about snowflake. I began to think of the idea of these frozen embryos and how they need some life. And instead of trying to create uh, some other ones, that it would be nice to use the embryos that already exist. And the fact that I thought of if it can't be genetically mine, then it doesn't need to be genetically mine as well. And that, you know, we're a team and that, that it, it doesn't matter. And so I, since I really like the idea of the embryos and and either into life here on earth or in heaven. I just realized this is a great option. I can't believe I've never known about this and let's definitely pursue it. However, I did I definitely did have reservations as a guy, maybe I don't know, of 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 being connected to another family. It's kinda of like, well, okay, we can't on our own, but this is similar. My wife can experience pregnancy and 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 right and then connect you know to the other family, well, that's just going to remind me that these children aren't mine genetically. And so at first I definitely had those reservations, but as we get into the process and everything, it's like, okay, well, yeah, we can reach out, you know, we can talk, and, you know, let's, let's talk more. And, and I really like their profile, that, and like Amy was saying, we seem similar, and, you know, it seems like we'd get along. And, and actually once we met them, it's, uh, of course, incredible. I don't have it any other way but to be connected with them. So just want to lay that out, that at first I definitely had reservations, and now I couldn't see it any other way. I can't wait for the siblings to meet each other. I'm, I'm glad to tell them that they have a brother and sister you know, in another state someday. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to that whole process. Yay. Thanks. Um, okay, next slide. So in March of 2009, we just started the process and pursuing embryo adoption through snowflakes and we both love the idea of embryo adoption because some of the reasons Dan gave also because I, I could experience pregnancy and control the pregnancy where what was going into my body you know and just enjoy the whole experience um, plus we said and you hear I've heard many times through friends that have adopted children uh, domestically that sometimes the birth mother changes their mind after they have the child so that kind of took that out of the equation and you know the more we learned about it we just thought gosh you know why wouldn't everyone choose this option if they're physically able to carry a baby that is of course and we were just so excited um, we thought maybe people just don't know about it. we sure didn't you know until we did our research and our doctor mentioned it we had no clue this was even an option next slide please Concerns about embryo adoption, of course. Um, it, you know, we had learned through our research that it could take multiple tries, and we had already had so many disappointments. I think the slide changed. There. Um, you know, we had already had so many disappointments, and you know, time was still a factor for us because we were getting older, and we we were just concerned about more disappointments and how to handle that. Matching to, you know, we were just, of course, scared. Would we find the right family? How would we know who that family was? What if we weren't chosen? If our, you know, profile wasn't chosen? And I already mentioned the clock was ticking. We didn't want further delays because we were getting older and never planned to have kids this late, but. Obviously, things don't always go as we all plan. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, once we received our first match, I remember Dan and I were just like, shell shock. We were like, it, it really hit us. We were like, gosh, this is such a huge decision. You know, we, we want to have contact with this family. We have to take this so seriously and, and try our best to, to make the right decision for not only us, but for this family. And, um, received our first match and uh, it wasn't Tim and Amy it was another couple and you know something just didn't seem right to us for some reason so we kept you know looking at it praying about it thinking about it gave it lots of time because we felt so honored that this couple selected us and before we turned down the selection we wanted to make sure that was the right thing to do and we finally did come to that decision that it just wasn't the right family for us so 
Delta Snowflakes and had our second match, which was Tim and Amy's profile. And, you know, it was funny because it was only about a week later, I remember we received it and we were all excited. And, you know, we knew pretty much instantly after reading through all their information that this was you know, the family for us. I mean, their health history is very important to us. Uh, we wanted to adopt from a family, uh, a Christian family, which they were. They were open to contact like us, and they we even had the added bonus. So they had similar, some sim- similar physical characteristics and stuff, which was great. Uh, so much instantly to that this was the family for us, and we were very excited to move forward. So, you know, we were excited but nervous, too. You know, this was uncharted territory for us. You know, we never expected we'd be going down this route, but we knew there were so many unknowns, but figured, you know what, we have to keep an open mind. We will work through this and and get through it, and if, you know, we all did if this was the family for us. We knew it would just work out, and, and we just felt that, that, you know, at peace with that in the end. So um, we moved forward, signed all the contracts, and then in July, which was much more than we had even expected, uh, July of the same year, we did our first frozen embryo transfer. We saw two, two embryos and uh, transferred both, and we were so thrilled and excited to to learn that we were pregnant on our first try because, again, you know, we had heard many, m- most families seem to have to try multiple times before having success, so we were just blown away. It just reaffirmed in our mind, you know what, this was the right choice. This was the right family for us. I finally had my first positive pregnancy test, and I actually still have that test <laughs> in my little, you know, storage uh, box that I'm saving. Um, so, you know, words cannot explain how, how elated we were and so grateful. Next, please. About four months into my pregnancy, we were um, taking a trip out to the Phoenix, visiting some close friends uh, on vacation. And I remember that Tim and Amy were from that area, so I reached out to the agency and talked to Megan to see if asked if she wouldn't be contacting Tim and Amy to see if they would be open to meeting us because we would love to stop and try to meet them while we were out in their area. And we were very excited to hear that Tim and Amy were open to meeting us and they invite us to come to their home for dinner. And uh, so we we went, and as the slide mentions, we had immediate connection. It just confirmed we had, you know, been with the right family. We got to talk a lot more about our journeys and how we got here, and and we just had such a lovely time and loved meeting their kids and, and spending the evening with them. Next, please. So, and... Faith was born in April 2010, healthy, happy, and as you can see by the one picture, she is our little miracle <laughs> with the little snowflake on her chest. Next slide. So I recovered from that. I was, of course, in touch with my fertility doctor again, saying, okay, how long do I have to wait before I can try again? You know, We had such, you know, we were so blessed the first time. I'm not sure if this is going to happen a second time, so we want to get started away. And so so by December 1st, only like eight months later, we, we did our second transfer and additional embryos and transferred both. We were pregnant again on our first attempt and this time with twins. So we were just, again, blown away, excited, a little shocked, a little nervous about how we were going to handle three little kids, only 16 months apart. But um, obviously we, we knew we'd work it out and this was a huge blessing. So we were just um, you know, so good to be expecting again. Uh, fortunately, I had a pretty uneventful pregnancy with the twins. Next slide. And both boys were delivered full term at 38 weeks, healthy, happy. And uh, Matthew and Michael were born August 2011. And uh, you have, to have three kids, two and under. And boy, we have our hands full. I, I keep joking if everyone has told me, but you must have your hands full. We'd probably have enough money to put all these kids through college. <laughs> but anyway, you know, we know this now, looking back, this was God's plan for us, and we love our kids like crazy. Um, next slide. Our, um, as I mentioned, she and I keep in touch through email periodically. We're, we're friends on Facebook. We send holiday cards and try to share pictures throughout the year whenever we can, when we get to and you know, reconnect. You know, we we both look forward to getting together again in the future, so uh, the kids can meet and and we can spend some more good time together. Um, and I'm going over to Dan again, so he can make some final comments and give the male perspective on the experience for this. 
I just wanted to say that uh, being with Tim and Amy was a great experience. We really enjoyed meeting them. They couldn't have been nicer and great hosts and uh, beautiful home and great children. In fact, it was really weird to look at their children. And Amy was pregnant at the time and think, am I looking into the future? Is that what my kids are going to look like? Very bizarre. But what a great thing. And, and that's what I really wanted to mention about this, is that this is the closest thing, hands down, to doing it naturally, to just Jamie and I conceiving on our own. It, many times I'd forget uh, that, that these were donated embryos, and it's like we're just going through this process. You know, she, she's pregnant, we're going to the hospital, um, birthing, the whole nine yards. I mean, how weird is it to tell your kid they're adopted, but yet they have pictures of themselves in their mommy's tummy. They're going to be like, wait, I don't get that. And but the great thing is, is that um, is that we you know really appreciate Tim and Amy you know donating embryos to us because what a miracle it has been to to be able to conceive and go through this and and bring embryos to life and, uh, and to think they'd be like seven years, you know Faith our daughter would be seven years older you know it's like she was like frozen for seven years and and what a miracle that she wrote and this beautiful daughter, and I can't love her enough. I, I really I don't love these kids enough. It, I, it, I definitely think about the fact that they're not genetically mine. It hits me now and then. But that pales in comparison to these wonderful children and having them and what a blessing it is. And, and just uh, I'm looking forward to all the great things we're going to be able to do with them. And, uh, and so this is an incredible process, and I'm so glad Snowflake exists to be able to give these embryos life and give them a, a chance. And, uh, and I just hope, and, and that's why we're doing this. I really want to get the word out, and I really would like people to know that this option is available because so few people do. That's it. Well, Ms. Kimberly, again, those it's really so much fun to listen to your stories and to the various perspectives on this whole embryo donation and adoption process. And it is such a new process, even though it's been around since 1997. You know, the work of the Embryo Adoption Awareness Center is to help other agencies that we have on board with us today to learn more about embryo donation and adoption. We brought this webinar today who are joining us today, whether you're an adoption agency, a clinic, a potential donor, a potential adopter, I think hearing the stories of people who have actually been through the experience is a great way to help you sort through all of the thoughts and emotions and facts that uh, really come into play when you're choosing to donate or um, adopt embryos. There are other agencies besides Snowflakes that do offer embryo donation and adoption. Those are all listed on the Embryo Adoption Awareness Center website, which is just embryoadoption.org. We are going through a um, adoption agency, one of the strongest um, uh, pros of working through an adoption agency to get embryos rather than a clinic is that you get to know the family um, from whom you're going to receive your embryos, and you know about one another's offspring. These are genetically related children. And um, as uh, medical science enables people to have more and more children through donor eggs, donor sperm, donor embryos, um, then for people to know about genetic relatedness becomes more and more important. In fact, one of the webinars we have coming up in the future is about the Donor Sibling Registry, which is an online website established by a woman and her um, donor-conceived son um, to help people find uh, relatives through donor egg, donor sperm, donor embryo. There are now over 35,000 members of the Donor Sibling Re Registry. So. Thank you all so much for uh, being with us today, and I, I want to, I think my next slide is about asking questions. We do have a few questions already submitted, and I'd like to um, invite everyone to please um, submit questions that you may have. Um, we'll open the floor to anybody who would like to answer the questions, and uh, again, you just type your question into the area where I have the um, red rectangle there on the screen. It's in the lower right-hand portion of your screen. Type questions, click the Send button, and uh, we will answer as many questions as we have. We still have about 10 more minutes left before the close of the webinar. Um, at 
the close of the webinar, you will be presented with a three-question survey, and um, I would really uh, urge you to please respond to those questions. As you respond to the questions, it enables us to provide information that is useful to um, folks out there who are interested in this particular topic. In the future, we do have a couple of webinars coming up in May and June. The Adoption Clinic webinars are always offered the fourth Wednesday of the month at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. In May, uh, we will be looking at the Embryo Adoption Home Study process. And so if you are an adoption agency and you are interested in offering Embryo Adoption Home Study, um, I would really encourage you to come to this particular webinar. Um, the web enables you to reach out to your clients about the option of embryo adoption, and if they do choose that, you can do their home study for them and then introduce them to an adoption agency that manages um, embryo adoption. It would be very similar to doing the home study for somebody doing an international adoption through um, another agency. And as I mentioned, in June, we will have something regarding the donor sibling registry. So all these uh, webinars are, the registration is available on our website, www.embryoadoption.org, and I would encourage you to um, get signed up those webinars. So with that, let's uh, check out some of these questions that are being asked. Do panelists feel that they would donate embryos to couples that are not having fertility issues? These are commonly referred to as rescue families. So who, uh, why don't we start with um, Anne. What do you think about that, Anne? Well, I think that um, I consider that option certainly, and I think as you look at an adoption where you have a say in um, – who's receiving those embryos, I think you can at a comfort level in making that choice. Do you have any feelings about that? Who <laughs> needs embryos that, that isn't necessarily having fertility issues? Yeah, yeah, I'm the same. I think just reading the profiles would, um, you know, you know I, I look at what the family would bring my embryos. So a family that really wants children, if the parameters have set that forth match, I wouldn't mind if they were a rescue family or if they were a couple having fertility problems. That wouldn't matter to me. It would just be if the goal would match what I would um, want it to be. Okay, great. Okay, next question. Does age play a large role for donors in choosing who they are going to donate? And if so, does under 30 play against me, this is a, a woman who is under 30, perhaps it's a man, um, how age for the donors, does did that play a role in who you selected to receive your embryos? Let's start with you. Sure. No, it didn't at all. I, when I, was re I also had um, two couples, and the first couple um, was not Dan and Jamie, and they were a younger couple as well, and um, they seemed, you know, obviously deserving of, of our embryos, but something just wasn't clicking and it had nothing to do with the age. Um, when I read Dan and Jamie's profile, I didn't even remember what their ages were. I didn't really look at their ages. It just, just to me, to tell, um, you know, Aaron, through my husband and I, we, you know, looking at the profiles, it, age was not a factor for us at all. It was more just a feeling, and we prayed on we felt um, that Dan and Jamie were the couple for us based on some of their history and which is found, and I love the Midwest connection because I'm from the Midwest as well, and to see more practical um, for me, common sensical people, and I just I love that um, part of it, and also just um, you you feel something I think when you read a profile. So age never came into play with um, to the mind. Okay, thank you, Amy. I think the other thing I would add to that is that generally speaking, the folks who have remaining embryos tend to be older adults not ancient like I am, but um, they have children, they're experienced parent, parents, they're unlike uh, a birth mother who finds herself with an unexpected pregnancy. So they're kind of in a different emotional uh, place when they're 
going through this process of selecting the family. And I think as both Amy and Anne have alluded to, it's really looking at the profiles, although Anne didn't have this opportunity, if she could look at the profiles of the families who are interested in adopting, there are probably a lot of factors that go into the um, choosing of a family aside from the age of the family. I'm wondering if maybe you have something you would like to add to that. And I'm trying to mute you. Yeah. Oh, I unmuted myself. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Um, Okay. Okay. Yeah. There. Okay. So I've seen a lot of families come through the Snowflakes uh, matching uh, program. We tend to see uh, a majority of uh, families when they come into the matching phase, they do an interview, and um, a lot of families put their age preferences somewhere between 25 and 45. Uh, some families will go up to around 50 or so, um, and then other families don't put any age preference whatsoever. So there's kind of a parameter of age preferences, and then we would send a profile based on that parameter. Um, and so if everything else looked really good but the age didn't not perfectly, we would call somebody and ask them if that was a hard and fast rule they wanted us to stick by or if that was a little bit more flexible. Thanks, Megan. This is a question that actually popped into my head as I was watching the presentation. Um, Dan, did you and um, Jamie have any, do you have any remaining embryos? And if you do, what is the plan for those embryos? Yes, uh, two remaining embryos, and that's, that's a tough one. We really struggled over that. Um, because, you know, they're potential children we couldn't live without, you know, but Amy and Tim had to go through that too. They had to look at all their embryos and go, okay, we love these two. These, you know, we don't know how many we'd get out of them, but we'd love them, to, you know, we just couldn't live without them. But that we, especially right now, the fact that we have three children under two, it's making the decision a little easier that more and we're still getting older would be called plus as as our and Amy call them a produced Amy and Tim produce rock star embryos and these embryos just worked for us the first two actually worked and one child there was a heartbeat but then that child didn't make it so we feel that we've got two rock star embryos left over that could really give someone a chance at having children so we really thought that even though it's a struggle to think that you know two children may not enter our lives, it gives the opportunity for someone else to, um, you know, and uh, then there'd be three families with siblings. It would be quite interesting, a big party someday. And so is the agreement between um, you and the Atsides that um, you will make the next choice about who receives the embryos? Amy. They come back to Tim and I, and... Uh, okay. um, so we do embryos now, and we are in the process of trying to fund another family. It's too bad I can't talk to Dan and Abby more, but I completely understand why they would not, not be able to do that as well. So um, hopefully okay. another family. Yes, and I, I would like to just mention that um, this type of arraignment is all based on the legal contracts that are signed between the two families. So the two families obviously have agreed that the remaining embryos revert back to the original family. There are situations where the donor family says, no, once we donate the embryos to you, any remaining embryo um, decisions are going to be your decision. And depending with the adoption agency you choose to work with, um, there might be some um, guidance around the destruction of embryos or what would happen with remaining embryos. I will say through the Snowflakes program, um, the option is to give those embryos life. So um, whoever has the remaining embryos needs to choose life for those embryos. Okay, one remaining question, and then I'm going to wrap it up. 
I am an adoption and pregnancy worker and would like to learn how best to encourage families to consider embryo adoption. I would like to know which couples might be good candidates. And um, may I open that up to you first and then turn it over to our families. And I'll, yeah. Can yep. you hear me? Okay. Um, that's a great question. Uh, we've been getting some Lately, um, I see families who are looking into adoption but are still uh, working with a fertility clinic or still verbalizing a desire to be pregnant. Um, they would be good folks to address uh, embryo adoption with. Also, families that are um, considering IVF cycles or donor egg cycles or donor sperm cycles where they're already thinking about creating embryos or embryos without their own genetics, they'd be good candidates to talk about embryo adoption with. Uh, so families that um, are thinking about uh, maybe international adoption because they're unable to achieve a pregnancy together, um, but they're a little bit dis by the um, high cost, including the travel or maybe the time taken off of work for travel, um, or they're really looking for You'll hear people say, I want the youngest baby possible. Um, they would be good families to approach about embryo adoption. Um, and then another kind of cohort is somebody who's looking for a very specific ethnicity child um, to join their family uh, through embryo adoption. You can certainly uh, look at the, the pictures of the couples who are donating their embryos and um, look at what different ethnicities of families that are uh, placing embryos for adoption to find uh, the baby that is uh, most desired by you. So those are some different uh, scenarios that are good to bring up embryo adoption with. Uh, the Lee family, do you have anything that you might like to add to that? you need me to repeat the question? Oh, I, I, I've got it. I'll go ahead and say something in, in case Jamie does. Um, is that my personal thoughts are, to everybody because they just don't know that that option exists. Adoption of a regular kid already exists is very well known, and, and, and let's definitely find those kids' homes without a doubt. But to me, it would be on the same, play, lay, um, same level, same playing field of, okay, here's international, here's domestic, and here's this thing called embryo adoption. Well, what's that? Well, it's this. Oh, I'm not interested. Or wow, you know, I didn't know that existed. That that I could actually give birth. That's a great option. So yeah, I, my thought would be laid on the table right with everything else. Jane, anything to add? Amy dropped off accidentally. All right, here I am. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, um, I had my mute on in case my phone was ringing here at work, but I was just gonna, saying I, I agree with Dan because as I was doing my research on how to proceed with adoption, you know, I had no idea that it was even an option, embryo adoption. And uh, the more I researched it and after going through it, it's it's just such a wonderful option that I think a lot of people still just aren't aware of and people who have kids naturally without any issues wouldn't know like we we didn't know because we, we never had to go there but it's uh, great that that things like this are getting the word out and hopefully it will become more mainstream just like domestic or dis international adoption are all right. Well, I'm seeing that it's five after the hour, so probably need to wrap this up. It, this has just been one of the funnest webinars that we've done, and I really appreciate the three families joining us today. Thank you for your willingness to share um, personal stories. And uh, we just hope that uh, the recording of this will be listened by others, and uh, we'll be using it to try and educate more people throughout the country about uh, embryo donation and adoption. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.